production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Kristen Morris, the Chief Government and Community Relations Officer for the Cleveland Clinic and a, board of, a member of the Board of Directors for the City Club. And it's my pleasure to introduce John Corlett, the Executive Director and President of the uh, Center for Community Solutions. For many of us in this room, John Corlett needs no introduction. When, he, when we're imagining forums focused on politics or policy, Mr. Corlett is often recommended as a speaker from individuals across industries and from both sides of the aisle. As a result, he's graced the City Club sta stage countless times as part of our panel discussions. And today, he gets the stage all to himself. Here he's going to discuss policy challenges facing Ohio as a new legislature begins its work this week, and we prepare to welcome a new statewide office, uh, all the statewide office holders next week. A public policy guru, Mr. Corlett's career has included leadership roles in the public and private sectors, including leading government relations and community affairs at the Metro Health System. He taught me everything I know. And as the state of Ohio's Medicaid director. He became president and executive director of the nonpartisan Center for Community Solutions in uh, 2014. Throughout his career, a passion for the underserved drove his work. He remains steadfastly committed to those who he says are in the shadow of the, of the community who needs to be taken care of. And he drives the center's ongoing work addressing issues such as improving maternal and infant mortality, enhancing behavioral health access, and supporting sound Medicaid policy among many other priorities. I count on John regularly for telling me the five things I need to know in my email just about every day. So thank you, John. A mentor native, Mr. Curlett has resided in Cleveland's Detroit Shoreway neighborhood for uh, about 30 years. Um, so please join me in, uh, jo in uh, welcoming to the City Club of Cleveland, Mr. John R. Curlett. Thank you, uh, Chris, for your uh, kind introduction. Thank you, Dan. Uh, it's an honor to be asked to address the Cleveland City Club uh, and to be with so many friends and people like Chris who I admire. Thanks as well to Dan and Stephanie and Noel and everyone at the City Club who helped pull this program together. You know, I still remember my first City Club forum that I attended. It was April 1976. And it featured this guy named Jimmy Carter, who was then in the midst of seeking the Democratic presidential nomination. I was a 17-year-old Carter campaign volunteer, and that city club, impression, city club experience made a lasting impression on me. And over the years, as Dan mentioned, I've got to attend scores of forums and debates on a wide variety of topics. I've even got to ring that gong once or twice. And the city club is an institution that's important to me and vital to our community, so thank you for having me. Yeah, when I uh, prepared these remarks, it made me recall my first experience testifying before the Ohio legislature after being appointed state Medicaid director. And yet, to say I was nervous was an understatement, because when you testify as sort of head of an agency, you have to read every word. You can't sort of ad lib or make things up as you go along. When I first started there, I always said I needed adult supervision wherever I went because <laughs> I didn't want to commit to something we couldn't do. So anyways, I was nervous about doing it. And, uh, and the end result was, I barreled through my speech in record speed. People said they didn't know anybody could read that fast. <laughs> and I didn't, and no noticeable mistakes or stumbles. But of course, all that meant was that the committee members had more time to ask me questions. <laughs> Bad. And, and, and when the first one was about the socialist nature of our healthcare agenda, I realized I had made a mistake. So I'm gonna try and take my time today, but still allow time for questions. You know, I've uh, lived in Cleveland my whole life, except for the occasional de detour to other parts of Ohio. When I was in Columbus, people always asked me all the time, 
well, do you miss Cleveland? And my answer was always the same. I miss it every single day. And that's because I'm all Cleveland. This is, this is where I'm from. My family's been in greater Cleveland for generations. My father's father immigrated to Cleveland from the Isle of Man, and they lived in East Cleveland. He worked as a streetcar conductor for the old Cleveland Railway Company. His mother moved to Cleveland from rural Ashtabula County and was from a family that uh, during the Civil War was active in the abolitionist movement, and her great-grandfather great served in the Union Army and is a Republican member of the Ohio Senate. My mother's family also lived in East Cleveland, but they arrived in Cleveland a little bit earlier and at one point had a dry goods store on St. Clair Avenue in the warehouse district in Cleveland. There's always been a tradition of community service in my family, and that's why you know, I've always kept this photograph uh, that I actually got a copy of. I'd seen once from my grandmother, then Gail Long provided it to me. It's a photo from 1920 of my maternal grandmother and great aunt distributing milk to Cleveland's children in Tremont's Lincoln Park. So that's always been sort of a central part of who I am. But today, I'm really fortunate to lead the Center for Community Solutions, an organization that, although it's had many names and even more logos, uh, <laughs> will celebrate its 106th birthday later this month. Community Solutions has always had as its primary concern the welfare and well-being of our poorest residents and neighbors. You know, we've worked over those 106 years, like the country, we've worked through wars, economic expansions and contractions, a growing city and a shrinking city, a civil rights movement for pe persons of color, for women, for the LGBT community. But we always approach our work in this largely the same way. We strive to be a trusted, nonpartisan source of information and data. We work closely with the public and private sector to identify workable solutions that whenever possible address the root cause of a problem rather than just the symptoms. We consult with organizations across the political spectrum and we encourage collaboration by offering a neutral, safe place for conversation and making our data widely and freely available. I work with a great team of talented colleagues, many of whom are here today, and our work is generously, generously supported by our board and, our, and local, state, and national foundations. So my charge today is to talk about some of the challenges and possible solutions that await Governor-elect Mike DeWine and the Ohio General Assembly as they tackle Ohio's next two-year budget. My remarks will focus primarily on human services and particularly on issues affecting children. First, the good news. You know, when DeWine is sworn into office next week, he will take over a state that in many ways is in much better shape than it was eight years ago when his predecessor took office. Tax receipts are running ahead of estimate. State spending is below, mostly due to underspending in the Medicaid category. Ohio's rainy day fund is overflowing uh, with over $2.7 billion, and our state unemployment rate is roughly half of what it was eight years ago, about 4.5%. But there are challenges. There are always challenges. And first, I want to touch on what I think is the political challenge. You know, despite Republicans scoring an impressive suite of state offices, We've witnessed an unprecedented degree of political squabbling among Republican House members for over a year. The cause was the, the, cause was the question of whether Ryan Smith or Larry Householder would become Speaker of the House. Last year, we saw Smith and Householder camps actually run candidates and spend millions of dollars against each other during the Republican primaries. The public vitriol was unprecedented. Despite these extraordinary efforts, neither Smith nor Householder had the necessary 50 votes solely within the Republican caucus to be elected speaker. As a result, they were forced to turn to Democrat members this past Monday to secure the needed votes to win. The result is that Householder was elected speaker. Householder and Smith, though, got an equal number of Republican votes, but Householder got the majority of Democratic votes. Householder, though, unlike Smith, because of term limits, can be elected to yet another term, so he could very well be speaker for the next four years. It's also important to note that there's also division on the Democratic side. House Minority Leader Fred Strayhorn was one of a handful of Democrats who voted to retain former Speaker Ryan Smith, but a majority of Democrats' colleagues voted for Speaker Householder. This process has produced wounds that won't easily be healed, and those wounds will likely influence the development of the state budget in ways seen and unseen. It's likely that both Householder and Smith made commitments to try and secure the needed votes. Those commitments, if kept, may become visible during the budget process. Remember, the state budget originates in the House, and it's not yet clear how members who voted for Smith, supported Smith, will be treated when committee assignments are made. If the Householder-Smith split, 
continues over into the budget process. It could mean that Democratic votes, Democrat votes are required to pass the budget. So the end result might be a bipartisan budget, or maybe we should call it a purple budget. Uh, so now let's consider, there's a second challenge I want to put on people's radar, and it's really a fiscal one, a monetary one. And of course, it's kind of an arcane one. So that's kind of the community solution specialty. We love all the nerdy, uh, geeky data stuff. Uh, and it has its roots in an unsuccessful effort 13 years ago by former Ohio treasurer Ken Blackwell to amend the Ohio Constitution to limit the growth of local and state spending in Ohio. You know, at the time, the measure garnered widespread opposition, but rather, risk, uh, rather than risk it getting on the ballot, then Governor Bob Taft, Senate President Bill Harris, and Speaker John Husted made a deal and placed a state appropriation limitation into state statute as opposed to the Constitution. Now, this statute, modeled after Blackwell's amendment, limited state annual uh, general revenue fund spending growth to 3.5% or the sum of inflation plus population growth, whichever is greater. Just water. <laughs> um, so the law also requires a recasting of the limitation every four years, and 2019 is the next year for recasting. This recasting could produce a spending cap several hundred million dollars less than expected state tax revenue. How much less? Uh, my predecessor, John Bagal, in a paper he wrote, estimates that state revenues could exceed the limit by as much as half a billion dollars in the first year of the budget and as much as $282 million in the second. The only way to exceed the cap would be for DeWine to declare an emergency and for three-fifths of the legislature to go along, a scenario that does not seem likely to occur. So even though state revenues uh, are recovering, these revenues may be off limits to budget writers. That could present a challenge for DeWine stated uh, policy objectives. Of course, they may, also, they may be able to manage it through accounting maneuvers, or the funds could be spent on the tax side of the budget without affecting the spending cap. So expect lobbyists for all sorts of interest to be flooding the state house, uh, particularly with their own favored uh, tax cut proposals. But I think dollars are only a part of the state policy story. Whether state coffers are expanding or shrinking, it doesn't matter if the political will doesn't exist to make things happen. You know, I worked for Governor Ted Strickland, who had the misfortune of holding office during one of the greatest economic downturns in the US history. But he had made expanding Medicaid for pregnant women, children, and persons with disabilities a cornerstone of his run for office. So despite the fact that the state was hemorrhaging billions of dollars in tax revenue, adding tens of thousands of people to the Medicaid caseloads every month, he never reduced Medicaid eligibility and he kept his promise to expand it. So political will matters. And that's why I am so encouraged by early signs from the DeWine administration that it, he intends to exert his political will on behalf of children. He told the Dayton Daily News that his kids' agenda was his top priority. One of his very first appointments was Leanne Cornyn as his director of children's initiatives. This sent a clear message that children's health, both behavioral and physical, will get increased attention from this new administration. She will report directly to the governor and will coordinate children's programs across all state agencies. He's also building a really talented team in the area of health and human services to help him achieve his objective. His choice of people like Maureen Corcoran to lead the Ohio Department of Medicaid and Lori Chris to head the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services show a real commitment to wanting to make things work. Having people in place to lead these agencies who understand both the programs and the politics will be extremely helpful. And I also have to mention that, as opposed to eight years ago, his cabinet is a lot more diverse. You know, more women than men and includes five African Americans. That's a good thing. So um, the, when Cornyn said that the DeWine administration's focus on young children would be sort of centered on five pillars, newborn home visits, early childhood education, mental health professionals in school, foster care, and drug abuse prevention education. A key tool for advancing nearly all of these pillars is the Medicaid program. Medicaid provides health care coverage for two out of every five children in the state. But for children with health care needs, with special health care needs, nearly half are covered by Medicaid. So the program is even more important for our most vulnerable and medically needy children. You know, for nearly four years, most of Medicaid's legislative and political focus in Ohio has been centered on the Medicaid expansion enabled by the ACA. It, cons it has consumed much of the energy of the department, and it's created a division between Governor Kasich, a strong proponent, and a sizable number of Republican legislators who opposed it. 
At the same time, most of the significant policy proposals that have uh, come out of the Medicaid agency over the past eight years have been primarily adult focused. And you know, and on the one hand, that makes sense uh, because if you're trying to save money in the Medicaid program, you focus on adults because that's the most expensive category of services that are provided. But I'm afraid we've, we've taken our eye off the ball when it comes to how the Medicaid program can be used to advance the well-being of Ohio's children. So where should we start? Number one, let's start with the basics. Make sure eligible children are enrolled. A recent report from Georgetown University found that Ohio's rate of uninsured children rose by nearly 20% last year, one of the worst increases in the country. According to their report, roughly 125,000 Ohio children were uninsured, and nearly all of them are likely eligible for Medicaid. Coverage is important for kids because it improves their access to needed services such as well child checkups, medications, and provides better access to a usual source of care. We have all sorts of data to show that public coverage is associated with better educational outcomes and long-term health and economic gains. So why did this happen? First, I don't think we've been focused enough on keeping children enrolled. Uh, also, some of the increases in uninsured kids is likely due to the constant attacks against the ACA and coverage expansions generally. You know, the Trump administration, you know, gutted funding for ACA marketplaces and navigators who assisted people with getting enrolled. The state should explore investments in, in uh, its navigation programs, particularly those focused on families with children. I also think we could just a statewide public information campaign that encourages and helps parents sign up their kids would also help. Now, unfortunately, a decision by the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services to end a successful program which allowed a trusted community organizations like the Cleveland Food Bank to easily assist families with children to apply for, renew, or reinstate these benefits could make things worse. These community assisters reach people where they work, where they learn, where they live and pray, so they don't have to go without food or needed medical care or other essentials each year but they've shut this door. And we're hearing uh, increasing reports of people drowning in bureaucratic red tape. For example, persons calling the 800 number report being on hold for two and a half hours before they could even talk to a caseworker. One mother told us that she only learned that her kids lost coverage when she took them for a medical appointment and learned that their Medicaid coverage had been revoked. She later found out that they had lost their food assistance as well. And she found it impossible to get through to a caseworker when she tried to reach them daily during her lunch break. I hope the new administration takes a careful look at these automated systems that have been put in place. We need to make sure that eligibility decisions are made quickly and accurately, and that children aren't losing their health care coverage or their access to food. You know, Community Solutions will be releasing a paper on this topic on Monday. If we don't fix this and fix it soon, our uninsured children's numbers will be even worse next year. Second. Ohio has largely handed over the management of its Medicaid programs to pro five private health insurers, four of them for-profit corporations and one the largest care source, a nonprofit corporation. Ohio pays these insurance companies billions of dollars to pay for and manage the health care services provided via the Medicaid program. To just give you an idea of how large the sums are, CareSource is the single largest recipient of tax dollars via the state of Ohio. In fiscal year 2017, Ohio Medicaid paid them nearly $7.3 billion to manage and pay for health care. And so we ask, how are these programs working? Well, when it comes to kids, the result, in a word, are average or less, or sort of just average or worse. When my colleague Lauren Anthes looked at how these insurance plans were doing in terms of providing access to primary care for children in the first two years of life, you know, immunizations, vaccinations, obesity documentation, nutrition counseling, the results are underwhelming. In fact, for all the minimum standards of performance for the healthy children population, not a single Ohio Medicaid insurance plan achieved the highest possible ranking. And, you know, I thought Bree Zeltner's recent Plain Dealer article shed light on another area of subpar performance when she reported on research by Cuyahoga County's Invest in Children and Case Western Reserve University related to lead screening. You know, the federal government states that all children enrolled in Medicaid should receive blood lead screening tests at ages one and two. But here in Cleveland, only one in five Medicaid eligible children have been screened as they're supposed to. That's, that's not only acceptable, it endangers the future health and well-being of our youngest children. We should demand that the health, plan health plans meet the federal standards. You know, we're paying these insurance plans billions of dollars, and I think we have the right to expect more than just average performance, particularly when it comes to kids. What's the solution? 
First, the new administration should re-procure their Medicaid care contracts, put them out for bid again, and beef up the performance standards related to kids. <laughs> you know, and, and we can also we can look to Oregon. They're proposing new criteria for choosing Medicaid health plans. They're looking at how the health plans plan to address social determinants of health, equity, and behavioral health access. Second, the state should also put more of the dollars they pay these plans at risk. They should hold back more of the payment until whether they see these plans actually meet the standards. And if they don't meet them, those funds should be redistributed to community-based efforts that are addressing some of the social determinants of health that affect kids' health and well-being. For example, providing kids with lead-free housing. Um, Another, example, another area that needs to be more fully addressed is the behavioral health area. You know, it often felt to me over this past year when we debated uh, behavioral health redesign that kids were kind of an afterthought, that they weren't uh, sort of front and center. And this was unfortunate because this took place at the time Ohio's child welfare agencies have been taking literally thousands of children into custody. Many of these children have significant behavioral health needs. Child protection involvement is one of the strongest predictors of poor health outcomes among children. These children are more likely to have uh, ADHD, asthma, you know, stress disorders, and to develop a substance use disorder as a teenager. You know, and last year we started to hear, hear of children's mental health programs shrinking or closing. You know, one agency in Stark County closed its door altogether and placed the blame squarely on the state's new payment system. This was an agency that it was serving up to 500 youth a year, mostly in the foster care system, and overnight they were gone. And, you know, last spring I wrote about a 27-year-old program in Cuyahoga County called PEP Connections that the state was going to terminate. You know, PEP Connections serves nearly 500 high-risk youth in Cuyahoga County with autism and other intensive uh, mental health needs. And if these youth don't get that help, they're at really high risk for expensive out-of-home placement. The state argued that the program was no longer needed in light of behavioral health redesign and that the service provided by PEP could be provided by the Medicaid uh, insurance plans. You know, fortunately at that time, State Representative La Tourette, uh, State Senator Antonio, and State Senator Burke stepped in and secured funding for a year to continue the program. But those dollars run out at the end of June unless Ohio the Ohio Medicaid Agency moves to expand and modernize the services that are available to youth with intensive health needs, not just in Cuyahoga County, but across this Ohio. Now, I know we can fix this with Corcoran at Medicaid and Chris at Mental Health and Addiction, two exceptional experts in this field. In terms of kids' policy, there's one last thing I want to mention. It relates to how Ohio is managing its federal welfare funds. You know, my colleagues Tara Britton and Bree Lussack published a paper last year revealing that Ohio was sitting on over half a billion dollars in unspent federal welfare funds. At the same time, the percentage of Ohioans who live in deep poverty who get any kind of cash assistance has declined only 15%. More than a third of those who live in deep poverty are likely single mothers with children. This is not an insignificant fact. Research has shown that single children, that children in deep poverty who are on Medicaid can have a mortality rate two times higher than those who are not poor. And yet you know, when the federal welfare law was uh, passed in 1996, our knowledge of the neuroscience of poverty as it relates to children's health and brains was not well understood. That's no longer the case. We know now from the research that is available that children in deep poverty are more likely, the portions of their brain that are central to stress response, memory and learning, uh, that emotional processing are all negatively affected uh, by that situation. And yet we're sitting right now in a city where roughly half of our children are below the poverty line. You know, in some neighborhoods like the ward represented by Phyllis Cleveland, that rate is nearly 80%. So why then is Ohio sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars when we know that there are very many, many very poor Ohio and Cleveland families with young children who could realize lifelong benefits with just a few extra dollars a day? Let's engage these very poor families with children, get them enrolled, and let's increase their benefits. You know, DeWine said his children's initiative goals are ambitious but doable and acknowledged the administration will have to make the case for funding to the legislature, especially since the return on investment for early childhood work can take years to see. DeWine said, do we have to sell this? Yes. Do we have to explain it to people? Yes. But I think this will be an investment that people will be willing to make because it's the right thing to do. Government is about setting priorities and we can't wait to get moving on this. Yeah, my 89-year-old father, who was born two months before the great stock market crash of 1929, was fond, of, is, was fond of repeating an old proverb to me when I was growing up, make hay while the sun shines. 
The quote was typically, I think, directed at me probably when I was laying on the couch not doing something I was supposed to be doing <laughs> or not pursuing something with as much gusto as he thought was required. He would approve of Governor-elect DeWine's admonition to not wait and to get moving. I agree, and Community Solutions is ready to be the state's partner in this work. You see, I'm, I'm a glass half full guy, I'm a pragmatist, I'm an optimist. You know, a friend told me uh, after I was on the radio this week that I was so gracious while letting someone know that he was full of it. Uh, <laughs> and I took that as a compliment. Uh, you know, you know we will, we're never gonna agree on everything, but let's not keep our disagreements from allowing us to move forward when we have shared goals. You know, I've been doing this work for a long time, and it bothers me how hyper-partisan the policy debate has become. You know, I believe both Democrats and Republicans have good ideas. In fact, I grew up a Republican. You know, in 1972, I was that 13-year-old going door to door on behalf of Richard Nixon. <laughs> of course, I matured and became a Democrat. <laughs> but you know, when I stepped down as state Medicaid director, I got two letters of thanks from legislators, one from Speaker Bill Batchelder and the other from Representative Bill Seitz. Not the first people I expected to hear from, but it was a reminder that we can work, if we can work through our differences, that our allies can sometimes turn up in the most unlikely places. You know, we're living in extraordinary times, you know, when political passions are often at the boiling point. But I'm still a gay, feminist, pro-labor, pro-civil rights Democrat, but I'll work with anybody. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm ready to work with anybody who wants to create greater opportunity and make this state fairer and more equitable. The governor's budget is due in just over 60 days, so I invite you to join me and my Community Solutions colleagues in working for a, a, more, uh, for a budget that does just that. Now, I hope I timed this right, and there's still time for questions. You know, I didn't get a chance to talk about seniors, transportation, HIV, maternal and infant health, tax policy, so feel free to fire away on any of those or any other questions you might have thought up over this time, and thank you again to the Cleveland City Club. John Corlett, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, I, I want to thank you, John, for going so slowly. <laughs> I know, I was like, I saw the clock. <laughs> I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here at the City Club, and today we are enjoying a forum with John R. Corlett, President and Executive Director of the Center for Community Solutions. We're about to begin our Q&A with all of you. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via the live stream or the radio broadcast provided by IdeaStream. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our team will work it into the program. Holding our microphones today are Outreach Coordinator Julia Wong and um, Content Coordinator Bliss Davis. May we have our first question, please? Hi, John. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to touch that. <laughs> okay, it's all you. <laughs> Hi, John. Um, first, I think we all owe you, our, our community owes you, our state, our country, frankly, owes you a great debt of gratitude for your passion and compassion in pursuing solutions that work for everybody, including the most vulnerable. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Not to not to sh switch this into a, into a downer, but I'm <laughs> curious. In in a time where terms like evidence and facts are themselves um, political hot buttons, how is it that an organization like Center for Community Solutions, how is it like a community, or how is it that a community like ours can advocate and move beyond when we can't even talk about the same shared realities? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I guess, I'll, uh, Dan, I'll talk about the way that, that we think about it. Um, you know, first, I think uh, when we uh, provide information or data, you know, we make it available to everybody. You know, it's not, we don't sort of hold something back and sort of say, well, this is the secret part you can't see. Uh, we show all of our methodology. We show where it came from. Uh, we show the source. But I, I guess the one thing I have learned over the years is you can't prejudge anybody. You know, sometimes we kind of think like, you know, like if, if I had thought that you know, Bill Seitz was going to write a letter to me thanking me for my leadership of the Medicaid agency, that is not something I would have anticipated uh, when I started. Um, so I, I think you've got to approach people with an open mind. Uh, you've got to talk with them. You've got to hear, because nobody goes to Columbus, I think, generally, I don't think, because they want to do a bad job. You know, they don't want to do a bad things for the state. You know, they have the things that they care about and believe in, and so you've got to understand that and figure out where there's places that you can sort of link up and, and do similar work. But you know, 
you know, we make all of our data available. Um, and I, you know, the other thing is, you know, one of the things we also do, we produce data for every legislative district in the state. We just don't do Cleveland. So we can go into any legislator's office and we've got information that is important to them. You know, one of the things we added to our uh, legislative fact sheets uh, a while ago uh, was we added the number of people in every district in the state who were, um, could be receive services from their food bank. Because one of the things, because we wanted them to know that sometimes people almost have this own vision of their district, and they think, well, there's nobody like that in my district, but there is in everybody's district. There are people who depend on these programs, and so I think that's you know important as well, showing that commonality of some of these issues across districts. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, my question is, with gun violence being the number three killer of children in this country, how can we get the attention of the governor and the uh, current legislature uh, to help with this issue? You know, I think that's a good question in terms of uh, gun violence. I mean, I think the piece that I have found sort of most uh, encouraging in that space is uh, when we talk about it as a public health issue. You know, um, when I worked at Metro Health, the Metro Health System, uh, you know, one of the things that always just floored me at the time was, you know, talking to our trauma surgeons at Metro Health. Uh, they said, well, you know, um, people who get shot are often repeat visitors. I was like, I mean, you get shot once and you come back and you got shot again? You know, I would think getting shot once would sort of uh, dissuade you from wanting to go through that experience again, but apparently not. Um, and so I think, you know, a public health approach to this uh, may be the way that we can make progress. You know, the one appointment that Governor DeWine, elect DeWine has not made yet is the health director, so we're waiting to see, you know, who that person might be, but, uh, you know, I would just, I just start you know, talking to them about you know, what some of the economic costs of this are, the, emotion, the personal cost of it are, and uh, the cost of our healthcare system. And, th and those costs can be quantified because um, you know, they're, it's expensive. Uh, and, tr and it's also cost the Medicaid program a lot as well. Thank you, John. Uh, I'd like to get back to the issue of preventing lead poisoning that's such a crisis in our community. First, uh, what do you think the chances are for some money from the state, as was mentioned in the PD article this morning, for uh, remediating uh, lead uh, houses? Um, and uh, second, uh, we just read about this new housing plan coming from the county. What, there was nothing in the Plain Dealer article about remediation that indicated there'd be any focus on uh, helping to uh, eliminate these lead poisoning houses. Great, so uh, in terms of the, what the state's role might be in this, uh, two things sort of come to mind. You know, one of the things that was, uh, that the state pursued, I think, uh, not this most recent budget, but the budget before last, uh, was to utilize um, children's health insurance program funds to ameliorate lead in pe people's homes of kids who are at high risk because you know they realize the cost that result when children get infected the medical cost and the cost of the Medicaid program but my sense is that the program has really gotten off to a really slow start um, and it and it is sort of it I think it's kind of um, it's kind of languishing in the state health department. Uh, and I think some of the ways they designed the program made it more difficult to administer. It's one of the things that we're actually gonna look at this year is we wanna look and see how that program is working. Because if, it, if, if we can figure out how to do that, then that's a good source of money uh, to be able to tap. The other thing I would mention too, um, my colleague who's sitting over here, Bree Lussack, is working on uh, looking at how TANF dollars through the Prevention, Retention, and Contingency Program can be used to ameliorate some of these issues. And because we're sitting on so much extra money, it may be another place that we might look uh, to free up funds uh, to be used in this area. I mean, and it may be something that we may want to, um, you know, we, we have, uh, not this year, but next year, we'll have a human services levy up again. And so maybe it's something there that we might want to add to that issue as well. I think there are a lot of different things. I think we've also got to look at, you know, I know that Case Western Reserve University is, is trying to figure, you know, doing a thing to look at who owns all these properties in Cleveland and, and to see if there are uh, deeper pockets there, particularly during the financial crisis. A lot of entities outside of this community bought up lots of properties in Cleveland uh, as an investment. And so I think we want to look at that too. So I think it'll take, I think, um, you know, uh, when I uh, was Medicaid director, um, I can remember going to meet with the budget director at the time and saying, well, I've come up with something that'll save $20 million. 
Um, and yeah, when you're in a budget of you know 15 billion, you're like, well, that doesn't really count. She goes, well, there's never usually one solution. There's lots of solutions. And so I think that's the case with this. We've got to look for resources wherever they're available. Um, we need to get the state to be more of a partner in this. Uh, and maybe we can get some help from the federal government as well. I mean, and that may be where, too, having a bipartisan budget may create opportunities. I mean, that is the advice I'd give to everybody who's working on issues in this budget. Work with everybody. You know, in, in, in not too long ago days, uh, you only sort of went to one side of the house uh, because they were the ones with the power. That may not be the case this time. And so I would speak to everybody and make your case with everybody because you don't, we don't know where the power may ultimately lie uh, in this state budget. Hi, uh, I grew up in Northeast Ohio and I left for about 20 years lived most of that in California and recently returned. So California, you know, is a high priority on being a green economy. So I was curious, what, what is the appetite here or lack thereof in Ohio for green initiatives or climate change initiatives or um, things along, um, along those lines? Yeah, I mean, so that is not my natural area of expertise, but I will still comment on it. Um, <laughs> so, and, and I, you know, I mean, one of the things you should look at is, I mean, what, I'm not optimistic. Um, you know, maybe there, you know, there was a special committee set up by, you know, Speaker Householder uh, to sort of deal with uh, energy issues, um, but I'm not sure what that will result in. I mean, a major contributor to his uh, campaign to be Speaker was First Energy, uh, and so, I mean, that's something worth paying attention to as well. Um, but I mean, in, in more recent times, we've kind of retrenched on some of that work, uh, particularly some of the things that were done during the Strickland administration. So, you know, I don't know. I haven't heard the governor-elect, you know, talk about this area a lot. Um, but that's something to I would I'd pay attention to it. So. I draw real comfort <clears throat> from hearing you speak about the Medicaid program under Dewine as something that will go forward. Uh, with uh, the kind of scale and leadership that you hope for. Uh, but uh, I turned to my wife for guidance on these things, and she was very blue during the campaign because she viewed DeWine as a, having a history of being very skeptical about Medicaid. Can you please uh, underpin <laughs> the, the half full picture that you've uh, <laughs> provided um, and, and leave me comfortable that we will, in fact, have a a really vigorous Medicaid program going forward. And, and I would ask that you set this in a national perspective, too, where some other Republican uh, administrations seem to be open to the program in a way that wasn't so much the case a few years ago. Yeah, that, that's a very good question, Rick. So I think, yeah, for the national uh, issue first, I mean, we're seeing sort of red states across the country embrace you know, Medicaid expansion in different forms. It may not be exactly the way Ohio has embraced it, uh, but they are definitely doing that. In terms of you know Governor Elect DeWine, you know I think you know, one of the things that people forget you know he served in the U.S. Senate for a very long period of time, and he was really one of the leaders in children's health. I mean he helped you know create the children's health insurance program at the beginning. You know I remember him as being you know uh, supportive on issues related to HIV/AIDS. So I mean he does have a, a history on some of these issues that I think is very positive. You know I think the challenge though the thing that probably gives me pause uh, is you know. Um, you know, Governor Kasich's administration, you know, uh, applied for a waiver to, to the federal government to uh, require people to engage in some sort of work activity uh, in order to maintain their Medicaid coverage. And I've always told people I'm less worried about the work activity than I'm worried about the process that people have to go through to show that they're complying with it. And, you know, we've seen that play out in Arkansas where just like three months, 17,000 people lost their health insurance, not because they weren't working, but because they couldn't get on the computer every day and report their hours and say they'd done this. I mean, we've gone from eligibility determinations once a year to once a day, once a week, once a month. And that, when you create that kind of bureaucratic, bureaucratic uh, 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 machinery, uh, it doesn't always work very well, and people fall through in the cracks. And that's, you know, and, and that's why I'm so concerned, as I mentioned in my talk, about this new automated system that we're using that kind of shuts the door to people. Because if you can't reach a caseworker, you know, and, and, and you go to an office and they tell you, well, go to the computer and talk to the computer, um, that's just not going to work. And so that's why I, that, that's the one thing I'm worried about. But I, I will say, though, that, I mean, 
you know, he has appointed a really great person as the Medicaid director, so somebody that we can work with, who I worked with uh, in the Strickland administration. So I, I feel very confident about her. Um, I feel very confident she believes in the program, wants to protect the program, and I believe we can make progress uh, on some of these issues related to kids. Hi, so we have a question from Twitter. Wow. The, pres the presidential campaign season for 2020 seems to be already underway. If you were advising the election or re-election campaigns of the various candidates, what would you encourage them to add or change to their HHS platforms? So, you know, one of the things I, I wrote about last spring that has seemed to bubble up a little bit lately is this notion of, you know, every, you've heard a lot of the Democratic candidates talk about a Medicare buy-in, letting people buy into the Medicare program. I think we should talk more about a Medicaid buy-in uh, because Medicaid uh, is a very economical program, runs well, you know, provides good services to people. Um, it's a state-federal partnership, so you've got both the state and the federal government involved. Um, it's actually more generous than the Medicare program. Uh, you know, uh, you know, people who are on Medicare today will tell you they still spend a lot of money on health care. A lot of things not covered. Those things are covered under the Medicaid program. You know, there certainly would be challenges around it. Nothing about this is easy. But um, I might look for something like that that involves a partnership between states and the federal government uh, to provide more health care coverage. I mean, because, you know, one of the things that's happening now is, you know, we are, and it would also be helpful to people who are, have higher, somewhat higher incomes because they're getting priced out of coverage. If they don't have a subsidy, they're having a very difficult time affording coverage. So a Medicaid buy-in that provided some competition for the private insurance plans that are on the exchange might be a good idea. We have another question from Twitter. What issues related to older adults do you anticipate or hope the DeWine administration will focus on? That's a great question. Um, so uh, there's a couple of things that I'm sort of most interested uh, as it relates to older adults. You know, first is around adult protective services. You know, we have a really horribly underfunded uh, system in this state for protecting older adults who are being financially or physically abused. I mean, I think uh, we give every county, I think, $50,000. Uh, which is not very much money. Um, and so, you know, Governor DeWine, or Governor-elect DeWine was a um, sort of a leader on this issue in the Attorney General's office, pays a lot of attention on it. Uh, so I'm hopeful that, um, that he will uh, develop more resources to that. The other piece that I really think needs to be addressed is, um, you know, the funding for the Senior Community Services Block Grant has not been increased for a number of years. In fact, we cut it in the last budget, uh, <laughs> which is... Um, uh, which has, uh, uh, I mean, as the number of older adults has increased, uh, the funding has gone down, and we've, we've not been able to get their attention. And, you know, we know that, um, you know, like, for example, home-delivered meals make a huge difference, uh, make a huge difference in people's health, their emotional uh, well-being. Uh, and, 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 and the other thing is that research has come out to show that just uh, a small amount of money and additional food aid for older adults is likely to keep them out of the hospital, keep them out of a nursing home, much more expensive uh, places to be. But we, it doesn't feel like we've been able to capture people's attention or sort of support on these issues. You know, we sort of, we made a run at it in the last budget and we sort of, we kind of got stuck um, and weren't able to get people to focus on it. So I think it needs more focus. Um, you know, there's, we've written about um, how we could change the SNAP program to make it more accessible to older adults, you know, to make it easier for them to qualify and to get a larger benefit because it's really important. And, and we have, um, you know, like the neighborhood that I live in, Detroit Shoreway, the Westside Community House, uh, you know, they actually have a waiting list for people that are homebound who are income eligible for uh, 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 meals but can't get them because there's no resources to supply them. And that happens in other parts of Cleveland as well. And as, as we see more older adults, you know, depend solely on Social Security as their source of income, you know, having this extra help, particularly those, for those who are homebound, I think is really important. So those are the two things around safety uh, and neglect and then around uh, nutrition. Thanks for your remarks today, John. And I think the beard really rocks. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll thank the barbers at Black Cats in Detroit Shoreway for that. So. Uh, during the Kasich administration, uh, funding to local governments was really cut. 
and how did that affect some of the policy issues that uh, your organization has studied? And do you think that uh, there's going to be any effort or any successful effort to reverse those cuts uh, during the DeWine administration? That's a really good question around you know the local government fund. I mean, the Kasich administration really sort of cut the knees out uh, from local government, from counties and cities and townships. Uh, it took a substantial amount of money away from them. Uh, it does, you know, uh, in some communities they use some of those funds for, particularly for like human service related topics, but a lot of places they use it. It's sort of the backbone, you know, of how they fund uh, local public services. You know, uh, Governor-elect DeWine has spoken about, you know, he's spoken to those folks, he seems sympathetic to it, but I think, you know, one of the challenge will be, you know, the thing I talked about in my speech about this state appropriation limitation. You know, if, if they've got almost three quarters of a billion dollars that's off limits to them when they write the budget, it makes it really difficult to sort of address big issues. So it may require um, some creative legislating uh, to figure out how to unlock some of that money and get it out uh, to local government. Although I would also say, you know, I would probably, uh, if we are going to provide more resources to people, I might sort of suggest what we might want them to use it for too. I, you know, I, I don't know that I'm comfortable with just sort of giving people kind of a blank check on some of these things. Um, in my ongoing quest to make you look reasonable. Um, <laughs> since 2005, tax cuts that primarily benefit the wealthiest Ohioans and corporations have cut billions and billions of dollars out of our state legislature that could pay for many of the priorities that you're talking about. So what do you think are the possibilities for restoring some of that revenue? And um, what do you think we could pay for if we did? That's, that's a good question. So um, in terms of uh, on taxes, I mean, you know, the tax reform effort that started under uh, Governor Taft, continued under Governor Strickland, expanded under Governor Kasich, has dramatically shrunk the amount of resources that are available to our state. And, uh, but I don't, I don't see the appetite for tackling this. I mean, where I thought we might make progress, Amy, was around um, the tax expenditure side. You know, we've got all these loopholes uh, in our uh, state tax budget. You know, the, and it's sort of like, if you get one of those, I, I kind of think of it as kind of like the lottery. Like once you get your, uh, your special interest, your loophole approved, it just stays there forever. It's like you, you can just go home and uh, you know, collect the checks or whatever. Um, but you know, we, haven't even, we haven't been able to even make progress on that to even get them to meet or to seriously uh, consider these things. And so you know, part of me wonders, well, maybe whether we should join them you know, in this. You know, if, if, if we're limited to uh, tax expenditures in this next budget as a way to get around the limitation, why not make the earned income tax credit refundable in Ohio? Why not expand it to more workers? Why not make the child care tax credit refundable in Ohio? Let's, let me, because maybe we can make a deal, you know, to get some of those things funded uh, that we've wanted to get funded for a long time. It may be the opportunity to do that. I don't know what the appetite will be there, and a lot will depend on the politics. You know, if, if this is a purple budget, uh, then maybe uh, we have more appetite. But, you know, I will also say that over the years, I have found Republicans as well as Democrats uh, both likely to give uh, tax cuts to interest, maybe different ones, uh, but both sides seem to be interested in that, so. Good afternoon, and thanks <clears throat> for all your great work. Uh, and your focus has been on statewide solutions right. generally, and you do amazing work. Um, lately, there's been a lot of focus, and it's cyclical. It happens quite often where we Clevelanders um, uh, do a lot of hand-wringing and uh, self-analysis about how we can move forward as a community and be great, be better on a lot of fronts. But right. as it relates to your issues, if you could prescribe or wave a magic wand as to the, the, uh, the city leadership or the county leadership, uh, what, what would you like to see get plugged into this process of uh, improvement that we're trying to achieve? I, I think um, the, the, the single most important thing we could do to sort of move this community forward in a long lasting way is to make sure that every child in, this, in our city and in our county has access to high quality early learning. Th that it, 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 yeah, we spend a lot of money on a lot of things that don't show the return that that does. It, you know, as, as Governor DeWine mentioned, you know, it takes time for that to show up. But I, I don't think there's been anything else that has been proven to be as effective as investing in young children early uh, in their life so that they start off um, in a more equitable fashion. I think also, you know, um, figuring out this lead issue, I mean, I think that is, you know, I'm 
I'm partially optimistic about that. You know, maybe there's an, you know, that will succeed in that effort. It's going to be expensive, but I think those two things, you know, but all I think, you know, focusing on young kids and what we need to provide them to have a more, uh, better future, I think is a really good thing. Um, so there's a, a no, for a number of reasons, our community has started to focus on criminal justice reform. And the um, and last month, I think a lot of people were shocked that there was bipartisan reform um, passed and signed at the federal level. The former director of the Department of Corrections, Gary Moore, spoke here last year. I right. think you were here for that. Um, and you know the numbers better than I do. That's a, that's a big chunk of the state budget that is immutable. Right. Um, <clears throat> unless, of course, there's criminal justice reform and people are, are released from, from prison. Do you, can you just address that a little bit? Or not put there in the first place. Or not put there in the first place, yes. Yeah, can you, can you address that, please? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, that's one of the things that, you know, that, uh, you know, a uh, new speaker householder sort of announced when he sort of won his uh, uh, race for speaker that he wanted to do a, a, create a new committee in the, in the House to focus on criminal justice reform. You know, I think we're, you know, um, a lot of people came out against issue one, you know, said it had lots of problems and, you know, challenges or whatever. Um, but, you know, we got to do something, you know. And so I think we need to hold people to their word that they wanted to do something. Uh, they just didn't want to do that. And so I think, you know, there appears to be an appetite for that. And you're right. I mean, where the state, uh, you know, when you look at the state budget, the largest number of state employees are in our correctional facilities. You know, like, so I, I know when I served in government you know, with Governor Strickland, when we looked to try to figure out how were we going to balance this budget, and we said, well, most of our employees are in prisons. We, we can't just sort of let them go. You know, uh, that, 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 that's not going to work. And so I think there's an appetite for it. I think there, this is another place where Medicaid has a role to play in making sure that we get people connected to benefits you know, before they leave prison. You know, the state's made a lot of progress in that area because a lot of people, particularly people with behavioral health needs, um, if they don't have access to their medications and healthcare coverage, they're going to be right back there. Uh, so I think, there's, I think there's a lot of places where we can sort of weigh in on that. But there does seem to be an appetite, I think, to do something. In your oh. prepared remarks, you mentioned uh, programs to deal with uh, or to educate young children uh, about the problems of drugs, alcohol, smoking, and what have you. We've had programs like D.A.R.E. for years and years. Personally, I haven't seen much results. Can you share with us some programs that seem to be working and let us know what specific programs you would like to see promoted? Uh, th that's a good question. It's, it's not pr an area that I'm particularly expert on. I'm also looking at my colleague, Bree Lussack, who wrote about this for us a, a year and a half ago. Um, you know, I think, I, I guess the one I would touch on the most is around smoking. You know, one of the things that just, I mean, really uh, sort, of, sort of bothers me is the fact that so many people on the Medicaid program smoke. Like one out of four Medicaid beneficiaries uh, smoke. Uh, at great personal cost to them and at great uh, cost to the state and, and taxpayers. So I, I think you know, there are examples in other states where they have put in place cessation programs that help people uh, quit smoking um, and show you know, positive results. I, I think part of the problem is we make it, some of these insurance companies, they're all different. They all have different sort of arrangements and we make it too difficult for people to get the help that they need uh, when they need it. Um, and, and these are issues that are not sort of addressed once and sort of gone away. These are, it's a lifetime, you know, of intervention and help that people are going to need to sort of either stay off of uh, drugs or to quit smoking. Um, but I think it, it has shown that if we make those investments uh, in programs, in services, making sure people have access to the medications or other services and supports they need, that they can do that. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to a forum with John R. Corlett, President and Executive Director of the Center for Community Solutions. Our forum today is part of our Local Heroes series, sponsored by Citizens Bank and Dominion Energy. We're delighted to have Brittany O'Connor from Citizens Bank and Ben Crack and Tracy Oliver from Dominion with us today. Thank you for your continued support of City Club programming. Our community partners for our forum today include the Chautauqua Institution, the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland, and Policy Matters Ohio. We thank all of you for your partnership in promoting our program today. 
And lastly, we welcome guests at tables hosted by the Center for Community Solutions, Cleveland Clinic, Cuyahoga Community College, the George Gund Foundation, the Positive Education Program, St. Luke's Foundation, and Youth Opportunities Unlimited. Thank you all for being here today. That brings us to the end of our program, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, John. Our forum is adjourned.